This is this is us trying to do a podcast some days. <laughs> The thing that says attempt to start weak battery, well, the, the last several seconds of that actually resembles uh, the relationship of Heidi May and Henry Rawlings. It's interesting, combative, explosive, and ultimately, someone's probably going to get hurt. <laughs> Hello, Earthlings. My name is Henry Rawlings, and the other one on the other end of the line is... Heidi May. And so, Heidi, before we get into anything, yeah, uh, don't don't get testy yet. I'm not testy. Okay, well, you know, you, it, it comes out quickly. You 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 rise it. You know, you you're like you're like a, um, a classical record. You have full dynamic range. You go from down here to way up here, like on a dime. Anyway. Several minutes before we uh, hooked up all the gear to bring you this podcast, and by the way, thank you so much for listening to it, I showed Heidi May a letter that was sent in by a wonderful gal named Heather who baked a pie, and she said, I baked a pie. I said, okay. So I opened the letter, and it's, it's, it's an image of a, I guess what looks like a blueberry pie, and the top of the pie, there's no crust on it really except for four strips, four rectangular strips arranged in the black flag logo. And she said, I made you a black flag pie. And I wrote her back and I said, fantastic. And all the members can sue each other over it. <laughs> <laughs> I want a bigger uh, slice. Exactly. <laughs> but you didn't write the pie, you get a smaller <laughs> slice. But I do get a slice, right? That is to be negotiated. Well, what if you put the picture of the pie on a t-shirt? You'll get sued. <laughs> and we know from experience. Yes, and so anyway, it was funny. And um, and it looks delicious. Heidi May is someone, and, and I want to get this straight. She has a diet, but she doesn't diet. In that she's not dieting. She just, there's food she eats and there's food she doesn't eat. She basically watches what she eats as we as we all should do. Heidi doesn't do sugar. She doesn't do dairy. She eats like kind of scrub brush clean good food. And it's cool. I mean, it makes her very, makes her too healthy for me. And that I can't handle it. She comes bouncing in here all bright eyed and bushy tailed, just furious at me. Anyway. No, I'm not. But anyway, so Heidi, I think she misses the days of sugar of her past. I do. When she used to look at, you know, whatever it was, <laughs> sweet tarts or Airheads. whatever. And just go, I love you, Airheads. Yeah, I love Airheads. And she used to love Diet Pepsi. Like she would literally mm -hmm. say hello to the can. Mm -hmm. I love you, Diet Pepsi. Yeah. And she'd open one <laughs> and drain it. And then open another one. And I would take, I'd take these bags out, bags of cans out to the, the blue recycle can. i go, <laughs> How do you do that? Like, shut up! I'm thirsty. I'm like, wow. I haven't had any Diet Pepsi in five years. Jeez. Sad. And you know why, ladies and gentlemen? Aspartame. I had to get. I had to get Aspartame. healthy. I got bit by a Lyme tick. <laughs> and and that's don't right. let. That was horrible. Forty days on antibiotics. Anyway. Okay. I do want a piece of that pie. Look at it. Yeah, we're looking at it right now. And boy, if we had cameras up, we could all look at it together. You know what I should do? I'll, I'll write Heather a leather letter, and I'll ask her if we, can, if we can post that. So if I can get the green light to post that, would you post that? Yeah, we could post it. All right, I'll, I'll write good old Are Heather today. Are we going to get today. sued? Well, I'll write Heather and ask. <laughs> no, but by everyone else. Well, you never know. <laughs> might be improper use of the logo. It might be. And so let me, let me, let me, let me break it down to you. Can we tell them about the book? Can we? Can I do a brief, like a, a ten-second infomercial about the book, or no? Yeah, you can, but this is going to be like you know three weeks after the fact. Okay, it, this is coming out way after the fact. I just want to remind you. How about this? I'm going to remind you that after a great deal of effort, uh, two thirteen has evinced yet another book of mine called Before the Chop Two, and you can find it 
at a nominal price at henryrollins.com. But this is in the, this happened a long time ago, so you're just being reminded. Anyway, uh, Heidi, I'm just going to ask you, just, just don't get angry. Is there anything that you would like me to talk about today? Any story you'd like me to tell? Anything you'd like me to recount? Any Anything you'd like me to juggle or any way I can entertain you and make you happy? Yes, I think we should do part two of the Rollins Band because we've gotten so many requests. That's true. Yeah. Okay. The Mother Superior years. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Um, a super brief recap of the first episode of the Rawlings Band. The Rollins Band came to a kind of a, a sad but eventual end at the end of 97 in Japan. Basically, the parts had worn out. The band played really well and really hard. Everyone was great, but it was over. It was just done, and everyone knew it, and it was just time for everyone to go their separate ways and prosper. And that was the end of 97. And so by early 19, uh, yes, by early 98, I was in touch with what would be the start, what would be, I was in touch with Jim Wilson, the guitar player in Mother, a local LA band called Mother Superior. Jim, I knew because he worked at Aaron's Records, which was, you know, was basically eradicated uh, because of Amoeba. Mm -hmm. Amoeba came to town, like right down the street from it and kind of ate Aaron's. But before Amoeba, Aaron's was the killer go-to place for indie music and all kinds of music. I was in there all the time. And I'd always see this really friendly guy behind the counter named Jim. And one time Jim said, hey man, he said he's like the nicest guy. Jim said, hey, would you listen to my, my band's new record? I'm like, yeah, man. And he gives me this CD and it's Mother Superior. And he goes, that's our band. I said, okay, man. And I, I bought some records and I went back to the office and I said, well, I'll put Jim's record on first. And I put it on and it knocked me out. It just, I loved it. Especially there was a song uh, called The Wiggle and it's just a really cool song. I'm just trying to be slick and see if I can pull it up, but I don't think I can. Anyway, it's just a great up-tempo, really sizzling boogie number. And, the, and you can tell immediately, Jim can sing his ass off. The guy plays guitar. He's just scorching. I called him at the store. I said, Jim, I'm listening to your record. You guys are killing me, man. When are you playing the next show? I want to go. If there's anything I can do for you. You know, like, if there's anything I can do to help, let me know, man. I mean, I don't know what I can do, but I'd like to help. And he's like, oh, man, thanks. And so one thing leads to another. And he said, hey, would you come and help us make our next record? Like, kind of be another set of ears and maybe help produce and mix. I'm like, yeah. And he, he said, you know, we can't pay you anything. Oh, I, said, I know. No one ever calls me for help with a record and has any money. So it's no problem. I said, so what's, what's the deal? He goes, well, we're practicing. If you want to come by and hear the new songs. I'm like, I do. I really want to hear you guys before the studio. So I, I drove down to a practice place, which is, I think it's like Selma, or one of those small east-west streets below Hollywood, above Sunset, but it basically kind of sort of dead ends into Hollywood High. And it's a row of practice spaces that the first time I practiced with Black Flag, I was in one of those rooms. And I see the address, I'm like, oh, that place, I haven't been in there for like a hundred years. And I pull in and nostalgia's hitting me. And I remember like the third or fourth night of Black Flag practice, I, it was like either in the room next to where Mother Superior was or in the room itself, Robo quit. Black Flag's drummer quit. Goes, I quit, I quit Black Flag, I quit. And he storms out and no one in the band moves. And I'm like, wait a minute, I just got out here. The band is breaking up. No, 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 no. No, the, the toy can't be broken. I haven't even driven the thing for 20 miles yet. So I went chasing after Robo. Like, it's up to me to bring the drummer back to Black Flag so I can have a band to be in. Why did he want to quit? Uh, he got mad at Greg. And, you know, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. <laughs> Robo quit. He would always talk about himself in the third, third person. person. Robo quit. Robo's had enough. So I said, I said <laughs> Robo, and he was just at the blow off steam. And so he walks out, I think he makes a left on Highland going towards uh, Sunset. So I kind of go, rubble, 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 and I calm him down and I 
talk him off the ledge. I go, let's go back into band practice, and you guys will get along. And he was gone by December. That would be around, this was like late July, early August. Anyway, so I go back in down memory lane. I go into this small room, and there's Mother Superior. And I said, hey, and I, I you know, I, I kind of met these guys before, and they're all really swell. So I said, play me some songs. They play these new songs, and they're just really rocking. And, they're, you know, they have fun playing. And I had, you know, I had, was done with Melvin sim chris and teo and that we had kind of broken up but i wasn't done doing music i had ideas riff ideas lyric ideas like a bunch of them so we got to talking and i said fellas would you ever want to like if i wanted to go in the studio and bang out some songs would you guys maybe want to be the band that plays the songs and they just no one hesitated like yeah did let's you, go did you go in there with that in the back of your mind <laughs> I'm not, honestly, I'm not remembering. But you heard them play and it came to you? Yeah, because they're just so into it. And they're such nice guys. I'd never seen them together in the practice area, in, in, in the practice thing where they're collaborating. Hey, let's try this. Because when we're work, we're, we're, we're basically pre-production. We're in a cheap practice place getting the songs together. They play a song. I go, okay, just listening, it's a verse chorus too long. I and mean, the thing, like, you're killing me. It's like six and a half minutes you got to pull it in at least for the record and we're making notes and that's when i started saying and no one gave me any resistance i go well, that's a great idea and they play it that way in one take i go okay shorten that by half and do something coming out of the lead like do half the bridge to come back into the verse so you're not jamming the guitar lead into the next verse and like and then one take like like this you're like yeah, wow, you guys are like session guys. They can just dial in and do it. They're that good. Did you say to them the first day, would you want to hang yeah. out? Oh, yeah, but only after I watched how quickly right. you go, try this. And remember when you and I were in the studio doing the Rollins show, the Rollins show, and R R Ryan Adams was, was – were you there for that? When mm -hmm. Ryan Adams you, – mm -hmm. you were there. Remember he said, okay, fellas – on this version of the song, we'll come, we'll do 16 of the thing at the beginning, only use your hi-hat, and do this and do that, and change your guitar thing from this to this. And they go, okay. And they would just do it perfectly. And then, remember, he did like five versions mm -hmm. of like three different songs, and they're all completely different, all single takes, because he said, oh, try this, this, and this. That's how the MS guys are. Right. They're just that good. And I just saw a band that can just do it. And I said, okay. I said, fellas, I've got, I got no band, but I got a ton of ideas. Are you at all interested in being paid in full to go into the studio and kind of sort of be a band? And they, they just kind of lunged at me like, yeah, like right now. I said, well, you want to take a minute and goof around? Because I, I, I got a riff. And they're like, Go. And it was the song Get Some Go Again, which is, there's nothing to it. I mean, it's like two notes. But it's just, I'd have it in my head, humming it. And I had most of the lyrics. It's not a big lyric, and it's not a very tough song to put together. And I said, here it is. And I hummed it to him, and they kind of nodded, and they went, okay. And all of a sudden, I have taken Jim's mic that he's singing into, and, and we're having band practice with this song, which we played like five times, just working on it. And... I said, wow, that was, okay, let me, let's go back to Mother Superior practice. I'm sorry, but let's, let's revisit the idea. And we got to talking about it. And I said, okay, how about I'll book some practice time, or I'm, I'm paying, and let's do some songwriting. And we got together, and we just, I said, um, okay, I got a lyric, boom, 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 and I'm looking for something with a lot of toms, like the toms are going to drive it. Like, you know, doom, boom, 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 boom. And, and they're, all of a sudden, Jason's taken off on this big drum thing. And Marcus, the bass player, is just filling it out. And Jim's looking at me. I said, I don't know, like a, you know, like some MC5 big guitar. And Jim, like, like this. I'm like, hey, we're a band. And songwriting, it was immediate. Like, we'd, we'd play, play for like three hours. And, wow, we have four songs. Well, you know, four songs that are kind of sort of songs. The only thing that would be lacking would be the lyrics because these guys can just write songs. And it's, it's, it's not 
Return to Forever. It's not Weather Report. It's not King Crimson. It's not like 80,000 chords. It's rock and roll. No, it's, but it's the rock and roll band you were wanting. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not here to put down my bandmates at all because they're all great. But the Rollins band with Melvin, Sim, uh, and, and Chris had turned into this thing where it got very jazzy, which is cool, just not for a singer like me. I need backbeat. I need a beat that makes me stand up and want to get busy. And, and you know what I'm talking about. You just yeah. need something that's behind you. And these guys are bing, bang, bing, bang, bang. My fellas, it sounds like a bullet ricocheting around a birdcage. I buy records like that, but I can't sing on it because there's nothing for me to... Sink your teeth in. Yeah. Yeah. And Sim and Melvin, I mean, these guys are coming. I'm like two and two is four guy. Those guys are coming from... Harvard math. Mm -hmm. And so is Chris. I mean, Chris, they're talking in like four abstract zero multi-level chess. And I'm like a guy who loses at checkers. And so I need Ramones, <laughs> Stooges, whatever. And they're coming at me with this whole other thing. And it, it's one of the reasons that Coming and Burn took so long to make. I said, you guys, help me. And so I, I really wanted a band. I, I didn't want to make dumb music or simple music. I just wanted to make really hard hitting rock music that you could play really loud and really enjoy and on stage play so hard your body would fall apart i wanted to do shows where everyone in the band would walk off stage completely destroyed because the music you can play it so hard that's what an audience wants i think well that's what i want as an audience member i want to see a band up there murdering it and I want to. I want them to break me to pieces with their music. That's why I paid my eight, my ten bucks to go in. I want you to rip me up. Anyway, that's what the Mother Superior guys delivered in just by the truckload, like effortlessly. And we had such a good time. And I'm used to play music for ten minutes, talk about theory for half an hour. Where the MS guys, they just plug in and look at you, and go like, "We're ready." I, and I go, hey, let, for fun, let's do a, a Thin Lizzy cover. You guys know Are You Ready? And they're like, oh, yeah. And, like, all of a sudden we're playing Are You Ready by Thin Lizzy. Like, that took seven minutes. And one goes, hey, let's play The Boys Are Back in Town. Like, let's do it. <laughs> like, And I go, you guys know that? And they're like, yeah, sure. And I kind of know it. But it was fun being in a room with three sweaty people who just want to bash it out. Because I was not used to that. I hadn't done, been in a band like that for a long time. And so that kind of infectious four guys in a room with their tails all wagging led to a lot of music making. And in a few band practices, we had kind of sketched, roughly sketched out like 12 or 14 songs. And so we, we banged uh, on them for another few days. And these guys are like ready. I said, okay, do you guys want to go record them? And they're like, yeah. Were you still on DreamWorks? Oh, yeah. I owed them a record. And I said, well, I guess this is my record. And so quickly, we go into, I think, uh, Cherokee. And we bash out the songs very quickly. And we go in with a ton of music. We do two sessions of like 12 or 14 songs each. We just had tons of tunes. Went to Sunset Recorders to do the vocals. And we're using Cliff Norell who engineered Come In and Burn. He's just like this guy I know. He lives in L.A. He's honest and competent as the day is long. He's just a seriously good dude, great engineer, and solid. Like, you can trust him when he goes, ah, too much bass. You're like, okay, pull the bass down because Cliff says there's too much. He's a good reference monitor. And so I trust Cliff, and Cliff loved the band, loved the music. He said, wow, this is really exciting. Let's, let's mix this and make it really, really cool. And so we mixed... The Get Some Go Again record, which I was really excited about. I'd put it on and get a real buzz. I'd listen to the song Get Some Go Again. I'm like, man, that's exactly like I heard it in my head. Like, this is a rush to play. I can play it loud. It makes you want to run around. Anyway, I play it, the, the thing for management. And their manager, Richard, goes, wow, this is different. I go, yeah, man, we're rocking out. He goes, yeah, I get it. So... He says, well, what are you going to call it? And I said, well, Henry Rollins and Mother Superior, because that's what it is. He said, no, 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 you can't do that. 
I said, why not? He said, no one will know what it is. DreamWorks will hate it. No one will understand the title. It has to be the Rollins Band. And I said, but it's not. The Rollins Band is, you know, the other thing. And he said, no, you, you've you made that name. You've earned that name. It's a name that people know. He said, we can't put you on the festivals with Henry Rollins and Mother Superior. You'll just No festival guy will buy it. That's just the sad truth. And was he right or wrong? Who, who knows? I mean, he's just talking. And, and Richard only meant for the best, but this was his expert advice. And I took it. And I was to find out that I maybe should have given that some more consideration or, well, and I, I'm only blaming myself. I should have handled it a little differently. And I'll, you want me to talk about that? Well, by calling well, the old members. Yeah, I did not know. I didn't, well, I didn't think that much about what calling this new group of people the Rollins Band, if what it would mean to the old members. And I didn't think about it because I, I was kind of done thinking about them. Like that 97 tour was in a way very traumatic. You know, you're close to a band, you're brothers, you know, you, and in a band, people die. There's divorces, marriages. I mean, there's real life stuff. We had been through all of that. And by the time the band was over, I was really done with those guys. Like the way you want to clobber your brother or something. You're so close to them. You just, just never want to see them again. I love these guys, but I was like happy to never see them again. They may, they probably felt the same way. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's what happens in a band. It's, it's why. Yeah, it's like divorcing four people. Yeah, it's like when bands can't talk to each other, but they can play on stage. Otherwise, they'll just beat each other up. That's kind of how it gets. Because you're just too much time, too close. You know each other too well. Anyway, uh, I had a bit of that with those guys. Liking them as much as I did, anyway, I didn't really consider them or their feelings. I went, uh-huh, Rollins Band, okay. Never thinking that it might bum those guys out. And I, I can't defend myself at all. I, I was just unthinking. As, you know, it's on me. And so... Time goes on, the record gets announced, it's in the trades, Rollins Band gets them go again. I get a letter from Chris Haskett, guitar player in the other, the older lineup, the original lineup. A guy I've known since I was like, kind of, sort of, right out of high school. And he's one of the goodest people I've ever met. Chris, there's, if you have a problem with Chris Haskett, you really need to check yourself. It's true. Because he really is. Well, he's a sweetheart. He's a real sweetheart. And he wrote me, and he's like, you know, I, I really... And he, in his own wonderful way, he said, I really didn't appreciate reading about the Rollins band that I'm not in, in Billboard. Like, couldn't you have written all of us and just either asked us or said, hey, I'm doing this? Like, why do we have to read it on MTV.com? And I was like, damn, I screwed that up. And he's like, he's, and Chris said, you know, I'm not mad. I'm just kind of hurt and kind of disappointed and I don't mind making people mad that just happens but I, I'm not into hurting people I'm really I, I'm not I'm not interested in that do you remember how you responded to him yeah I said I'm sorry man I, I, I that's on me and I said you know Richard suggested that it's a name that has been you know suggested uh, you know that that's been established but I should have done that and I'm sorry. And I didn't hear from Melvin or Sim or Teo immediately, but I discussed it with all three of them in the years afterwards. Sim and I were in the back of the bus on that weird Rollins Band X tour in 2006. And he looked at me, he was smiling. He said, you know, for a while, I really hated you. <laughs> I love the honesty. And I looked at him and I said, same here, my friend. And we both just laughed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I talked to Melvin about it. He said, yeah, man, I know you were doing what you had to do. He kind of had an, a, an adult pro thing on it. And Teo, he says, Teo. He goes, oh, man, you know, who gives a shit? <laughs> he, just, just, he, just, he just rolls. Anyway. We go into the studio and we record in like two different sessions 
an incredible amount of music where we are literally spoiled for choice, you know, like 30 some songs. And so we throw a bunch on the record. We ask Wayne Kramer uh, to come into the studio and play on a song that we had written. And I just thought, oh, this is a cool jam in it. And I can just really hear brother Wayne Kramer on this, who's a buddy of mine. And I, I asked my bandmates, I said, I'd like to ask Wayne Kramer, and they know who he is, MC5. I said, you know, it's your band too. So I'm not going to ask him before I ask you guys. I said, is it okay? Because I knew what the answer would be. I said, would it be okay if I brought Wayne Kramer in here to uh, be on the record? And they just looked at me like they all just won the lottery. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah, well, I'm going to call him and see. And I called Wayne, and Wayne said, are you kidding? Where are you guys right now? I'm on my way. He just, like, flew over. He's like a really good guy. We played him the song, and we actually we did it live. I said, okay, here's the thing, and I, I basically i am going to call you guys up like James Brown. I'm going to say, Brother Wayne, why don't you step up here right now and, like, testify with your guitar? And we kind of did it like that. And Wayne Kramer's a guy you can say all that stuff to, and he'll just drop in right when he's supposed to. So I said, I want to do it like Live of the Apollo Volume 3, the James Brown record, where James Brown brings in like Maceo or whoever does solo. And he goes, on it. So we set up and we did it. We did two takes. And then I said, okay, since we have you here in the studio and we're all creative, happy people, how about we get together and write a song right now? And we just did it. It's called Hotter and Hotter. And it's really good. And I think it was Jim's riff, and he kind of had it, and we just put it all together, and Wayne's on it, I, we're all on it, and like that just happened, and it was so much fun. Like, wow, thanks, Wayne. We, we have a, another song in the set. And so Wayne's on like two songs on that album, I think. And then knowing that Thin Lizzy had never done their song, Are You Ready, on a studio album. There's a demo studio version of it. But formally released, no, it's only on their live albums. It's just a great live song. And I actually sang that with members of Thin Lizzy in 1996, uh, the 10-year anniversary of Phil Linnett passing away in, in, when I was in Dublin. Anyway, I, I said, you guys want to do a studio version of Are You Ready? Because Thin Lizzy never did it. And the guys are like, yeah. I said, let me do this. You know, I got the green light from the guys. They'll do, they'll do, are you ready? I contact Scott Gorham of Thin Lizzy, the guitar player. And, I, and Scott's kind of sort of a buddy of mine. And I said, Scott, here's what we're doing. We're doing, are you ready? Here's what. What if we sent you the two-inch tape? You pick the studio in London that you like because he makes records. The tape will be waiting for you. My road manager buddy, Rick, who he knows will get your gear or rent you what you want from John Smith or whatever the name of that rental place is and just make it easy where you walk with your guitar, hit it and quit it and I'll, and I'll pay. I mean, just like, I want to make this like, like you're having a great time. And he wrote back immediately and he said, you know what? I get a lot, a lot of people cover Thin Lizzy and a lot of people ask me to be on their record and I always politely decline, but there's no, you know, we never did that on a record. And you showed up when I asked you to be on the benefit show for Phil. I kind of owe you one. And I like you. And you guys, you know, sound like you're cool. You got it. So we sent him the tape. Oh, this is one of the best things ever. Sent him the tape. And like a week goes by. We're mixing. We're doing our own thing. The tape comes back. And, you know, Scott says, hey, I had a great time. It went really well, and the tape should be back with you. Like FedEx, Blue Label, it came back to America. It gets sent to the studio. And Cliff goes, hey, uh, the, they just called from the lobby. The two-inch from England is back. And so we finished whatever we were mixing for the day, and we put on Are You Ready? And we pushed up the faders of Scott Gorham. And Scott had laid down... I mean, it sounds like Scott Gorham. And the guy has a signature sound. And you're like, that's Scott Gorham. And like your hair stands up. And he's playing with you. And he did like a lead track. He did these cool rhythm tracks. You're like, damn, that's, he's such a badass. 
And it was so much fun to mix that song because no matter how you mix it, it sounded great. And so we brought the guys in. We sat them down. We said, are you ready for this? And we hit play and just see the three guys, the smiles on their faces. Like they go from, and I'm not saying, you know, they were no one. I'm just saying they went from a local L.A. band. And all of a sudden, you know, we did the MS record. I, I helped them with their record. They're in the studio with me. They're getting paid. They're sessioning with Wayne Kramer. And then suddenly they're hearing themselves playing with Scott Gorham. <laughs> and they're like... It must have blown their minds. It blew my mind, too. But, yeah, for them, they're like, wow, this is pretty cool. So, anyway, I said, all right. So, we're going to make a record. I want to call this the Rollins Band. And, and, you know, they're like, yeah, man, like, whatever. I said, you guys want to tour? And they're like, yeah. I said, you want to really tour? Like, I said, I'm used to, like, you know... We'll see you when the leaves turn color. Like, <laughs> we'll see you later. And they said, are you kidding? We've been waiting all of our lives to, to tour like this. I go, this is full time, but it's real pay. You will be away from home, family. I mean, I don't know these guys that well yet. I said, whatever you've got going, wife, kids, girlfriend, whatever it is, you're going to be away. I mean, you want to do this, you got to put, it's, it is what it is. And they're like, they couldn't wait. When DreamWorks got the album, what'd they say? They were, they were never, ever happy with anything I ever gave them. Except Liar. Well, they didn't get that. That was on the album before in no, Imago. I, oh, but that's what they always wanted. So, so when we had the meetings with them, they said, so do you have any songs that sound like Liar? Right. And I said, no, sir. Because I'm always, you know, you got to be honest with these people. I went, No. Like a smart guy in the band go, yeah, you know, we're working on something just like it. It's called no, Fibber. No, you have to be honest. Uh, you know, well, just to get the deal. <laughs> and I said, no, I'll, and I'll never do a song like that again. I mean, that's just a thing we did. And they said, well, and I'll never forget this. Can you try? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> anyway, and that's like, hello, red flag. I mean, and, but we signed anyway. We do come in and burn. There's no, there's nothing on it like liar. And they're like glum. I give them this kind of in-your-face rock album, and they're like, uh-huh, is there anything like Liar? And I'm like, no. And they're like, What did they okay. release as the single? I think Get Some Go Again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they put out the CD with the wrong track listing. I remember that. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. And the this thing is a spinal is, tap moment. The thing is so wrong, obviously, they're not going to redo it. And it's confusing. You put on, you're like, well, what, what is this? And it's wrong is what it is. And so it was a problem. Anyway, we, uh, we do a video for the song uh, uh, Illumination. I think that was, that was on Get Some Go Again. Yeah. And I, I went, uh, I, I said, I'm going to go to India. I'm going anyway. If you want, maybe we should get some footage of me in India and use it in the video because the song is about traveling and kind of having your mind blown by what you see. And they got that together. We actually filmed like for two or three days in uh, Calcutta on the eastern part of the country. And that was in the video. Then we shot the rest of it on top of a building in downtown LA with a band. It looks awesome because it's me in India like with cobras and, and you know. I all remember. The, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And then cut to us you rocking out with a big la downtown you know like motley crew <laughs> size video with a crane shot it's ridiculous anyway dreamworks did not like the record um at all and they made really no bones about it and we were that was the lame duck record that's the last record and so it's not for them to put any money into it because as soon as they release it we're done with them and so they kind of put the record out and went, okay, well, see you. And with, and I'm not trying to put them down. It is what it is. And you go back into the label, and they're like, can we help you? You're like, yeah. My name's Henry Rollins. I'm in a band called the Rollins Band. Yeah. Um, my A&R guy's got a name, Adam. They said, yeah. I said, can I, I'm supposed to meet him here. Can you tell him I'm here? And, and, and who did I, who, who's called? I said, my name is Henry Rollins. And you don't even get mad. Because this is like, that woman doesn't know. Right. But this is the, the harsh corporate mm -hmm. environment that you would be foolish to try and be an artist in. <laughs> and Adam comes out, hey, man. Uh, I go, so how are your bosses liking the record? Well, you know, uh, 
and he has to speak in industry speak. I, I, they don't know how it's going to perform. I'm like, uh-huh. Anyway, it's just now is just for me to go on tour. And so the guys and I, I said, all right, fellas, we got some summer festival dates to start. And we did that one warm-up show at uh, Cole Rehearsal. You were there. And we did like, like a 45-minute set. Here's the new band, ta-da. And the next time we played together on a stage, I think it was in Portugal, with Metallica, opening for Metallica. What were those guys thinking? I mean, they, their heads must have... They were. They walk into a bullfighting stadium. It's a stadium. It's Metallica. You think they sold some tickets? Are you kidding? I mean... So Grand, from, grandmothers are at this the show. From Troubadour to a... Yes, to Metallica. Right. It's not like we're on tour with them. It's one show. And so we go out to play, and which is typical of a band that is truly iconic. Their fans only want to see one band. Like when you open for Iron Maiden, which we had the, the great displeasure of doing. <laughs> I mean, Iron Maiden's fine, but their audience they wants... They want Maiden. Yeah, and they're willing to wait in the rain and have no bands play for three hours, if they can just have Iron Maiden. You would, I don't know what band you'd have to be, you'd have to be like Black Sabbath for them to go, oh, okay, I, I can dig this for 45 minutes, but I want Iron Maiden. Metallica fans are like that, because Metallica's gonna do like a two and a half hour, I mean, you're gonna get your money's worth. They don't need, they're like Zeppelin or the Stones. They, they don't need an opening band, it's enough. They're, they're the full thing. Anyway, there's two opening bands, we're the middle slot, and we went out to play, and the audience is like, who are these guys? And we don't like it, because it's not Metallica. Members of Metallica went on to stage left and stood and watched us and kind of like, you know, nodded their heads like they're into it. And oh, the, that was nice. All the audience, oh, it was a total... Yeah, the audience could see it. Yes, and the audience went, oh, they like it. Like, like uh, what's the bass player's name? The, the second one. Not, not Cliff. Cliff was sadly had long passed away. But the, the guy who just quit before Robert joined many years ago. Anyway, he came out and watched like a lot of the show. And you know, I think Hetfield came out for a minute, gave it the FaceTime. And they did that to say, hey, Metallica audience, these guys are Metallica approved. And it's, that's, that's nice. It's really cool because they didn't have to. But that's what that was. That's them coming out and saying, hey, don't throw anything. This is a band we asked to be on stage. And soon as everyone, the crowd roared. I'm like, what's so, what's exciting? And they're all looking to my left. And you go, oh, there's half of Metallica. That's kind of like on there, like giving it the thumbs up and, you know, saluting the crowd and walking away. And then everyone was like, okay, we'll tolerate you for the next 25 minutes. So, so. let me ask you, when you were on stage with those guys in that arena, did you look at like Jason and Jim? What were they like, were they just smiling? Oh, they were just one huge smile. One huge, collective, happy dog in the rain. It, it's a it's a hell of a thing to go from playing Coconut Teaser, which yeah. is as big as your car. Mm -hmm. You know, attendance, uh, you know, it holds like, what, 40 people? About. <laughs> yeah. To, I don't know, 25,000 people who are obviously there to see a different band. But it's a lot of faces in the place. Anyway, we did a, a handful of European dates. And they came home, and they're like, man, thanks. No one in a band I've been in has ever thanked me for anything. And I was like, uh, okay. And we began touring, like, 98, 1999, somewhere in there, in earnest. You know, Rollins Band style. How long were you guys on tour? <sighs> like you do, 75 shows, 150. I mean, we just went and went and went and went. You know, all of America... Canada, Europe. And they never got burned out on it. They loved it. Oh, we had one tour where they opened. Mother Superior was oh, the opening right. band. And the, and I said, are you guys tired? And they're like, oh, no. <laughs> and like Jason, the drummer, he's like half man, half gazelle. Like I used, to, I used always used to joke and say, you know what you are? You're the upgrade. You're like what's going to happen like 500 years from now. We'll all look like you. <laughs> He would run with Daryl, the sound guy, who's just ridiculous. They're both, the most, they're like Tarzan. The Daryl's ripped. They're just these strong guys who can, with endless energy, they'd go out and do 10-mile runs. And like, then play two sets. And then to play two sets, yeah. That's Jason running like for like two hours with Daryl, like all over wherever we are. 
And I'm like, where have you guys been all day? Oh, we're out running. They're like, you guys are nuts. And then he, Jason goes out for like, I don't know, like two and a half hours and just beats it to death. And after two sets and all that, they come up after the show, man, thanks a lot, man. It's really fun. You're like, okay, you think? I mean, just, I never got over the endless gratitude. And so I did a thing, and I, 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 it's a thing I always tried to do when I became kind of, quote, the boss. But it's a thing I was really careful with. I would never tell them. I'd say, okay, here's the time period we're touring, April to October. So just, you know, get ready to be on call in that time. So whatever you need to stop doing, get ready. But I'd never tell them the particulars, like we're going to Japan, we're going to Australia, until it was in stone. So what I said was never a maybe, or what I said was never like, oh yeah, sorry, that went away. When the ink had dried on the contract and the plane tickets were booked, I said, fellas, in two weeks you're going to Tokyo, and here's your plane ticket. So my word became as sure as the sun coming up tomorrow. And I think that had an effect. Like if Henry says it, it happens. I also did a thing where we would record and they would get a recording bonus. Like you're in the studio working, so you're going to get paid for that, which is not always what bands do. It's what I wanted to do. And that was Adam, that's my money. And I just wanted everyone to be in the studio, just like happy. And at one point we're recording, I think the nice record. And we're in there knocking ourselves out in studio A in the now sadly gone Cherokee studios. And I said, Jim, does Mother Superior have any songs? He's the principal songwriter. And Jim is like, yeah, he's like, he's a miracle on two legs. He's like, oh yeah, I've got like 28 new songs. The guy <laughs> writes like four songs in a day. I said, how about this? Rollins band goes in like, you know, 10 to six, and then, you know, Cliff's ears are done. He's done for the day. How about this? If you can convince Xander, the really cool young engineer who loves Mother Superior, if you can convince him to stick around, bribe him with money and food, why don't you guys hold on to the, the studio for the rest of the night and start doing your Mother Superior record and just buy your own tape, but you have a completely tuned room the instruments are already set up. If you break a drum head, you pay for it. And just make sure there's a drum head I'm not paying for the next morning when Rollins Band records. But make your mother superior record for the price of the engineer, the tape, and pizza. And they said, that's okay with you? I said, I won't be here. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm done with you for the day. I, I got to get out of here. And so Jim asked the band. And the band were like, yeah. So they made this great sounding record for next to nothing. And Xander, the engineer, like loves those guys. He said, you got it. And they, those guys would work like 10 a.m. to like, you know, one in the morning and then come back in the next day. Oh man, we recorded like five new songs. You guys sleep? Well, not much, but we're ready. And they're just like the best guys. And we would tour our asses off so hard. And no one ever complained. Like, Ever but that's why once. I think you wanted to do extra stuff for them because they were so grateful. Yeah. It makes you want to do things. No, the for gratitude people. thing, it makes you want to give Absolutely. everything. Like when you have an audience that's just into it, mm -hmm. like, okay, this is the night I'm going to play until I have a heart attack. Right. I'm going to give you everything I've got because that's what performers do. And these guys, they got it. They really understood that this was a good time. Where I had been in bands. Where I say, hey, we're going to Russia. And they're like, really? Again? That's a really long plane flight. I'm like, really? You lucky bastards. We're going to Moscow. You can walk to the Kremlin from the hotel. Like, cheer up. This is awesome. You're seeing the world. And so I said, hey, Mother Superior guys, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And they're like, oh, man, no way. Thanks. And I'm, you know, when I imitate them, I make them sound kind of like Spicoli, but I'm not. But they were, they're like, oh man, Henry, th this is so great. And when I said, we're going to Japan, you know, for them, that was a dream. And they said, really? I said, well, I said so. The tickets are booked. We're, you're playing Fuji Fest, Mount Fuji, Fuji Rock. And they're like, man, thanks. And we, you know, played in front of like, you know, this field, this huge field of people. And so one time we go to Australia. This is the, I love this story. We go to Australia, 2000, somewhere in there. 
And we, we land, and I find out ZZ Top is touring, obviously different venues, but we're both going to be in Perth, I believe, in the western part of the country, gorgeous bit of land at the same time. And so I say to the road manager, I say, um, can you find ZZ Top's road manager? It's like a small country, 10 venues, four record stores, three radio stations. Pretty easy to find the other band in town. He goes, yeah, let me get on that. He goes, tell the, their people to tell Billy Gibbons, the guitar player, that Henry Rollins and his band are in town. We're both playing the same, at, you know, we're both playing tonight. They're going on at eight, we're going on at 11, you know, whereas we're playing some big bar. We would like to come to the show and we would like tickets. And my band, you know, all of my bandmates love ZZ Top, like I do. And they're looking at me like, whoa. And I'm thinking, <laughs> man, if I can pull this off. <laughs> You'll be keen. I will walk on water with these guys. The phone rings like 10 minutes later. Hey, Billy's really happy you guys are in town. He can't wait to see you guys. And you're getting backstage all access. And like, we're at Soundcheck at our venue. And we, you know, we get the, the some guy who comes over because the venues are like two miles apart, like the Mega Dome and like some bar we're playing. And here's your laminates, here's your passes. You guys are in. Show starts at you know whatever, and we jam over there, watch this set, and then come back and go on late at night with, with our audience. You know, like ah, just complete Australian maniacs. So we're playing. We come out for the encore. And Mike, Dark Mike, he pulls me and goes, okay, um, I've told everyone in the band, don't freak out and don't be too obvious, but you have a fan down in the barricade. I'm like, okay, weirdo. Like, what, what is he telling me? <laughs> I walk out and look down and there's Billy Gibbons. He's still in his stage gear, like looking up and like waving. Like, I, I'm, not, so he's cool. like, I'm not here. I'm like, okay, okay. Because people can't really see him because he's kind of kind of underneath them. And I said, uh, and I said, fellas, let's, we have a song, we had a song called Hello. I said, let's, it's a blue song. I said, let's do Hello because Billy. And he goes, okay. And they said, okay. I said, I want to dedicate this to some small band from Texas that's, uh, you know, played across town tonight. This is dedicated to the Reverend, Reverend Billy G. Hello, hello, boom, we go into the song, and I look down at Billy, and he looks up like, yo, thanks, man. <laughs> and after the show's over, the band's backstage, and Billy Gibbons walks in. He's like, and I've known, I've well, met him many times over the years, like the nicest guy. And he walks in, and my bandmates are like, and, and Mike and Daryl, everyone is just standing, like, at attention. And they're like, whoa, 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 Mr. Gibbons, oh, call me Billy, man. He's like, he's a really nice guy. And he goes, and he said, went up to Jim, he goes, Jim, like, you are a great player. And Jim's like, oh, my God. Jim was like, he must have uh, had a heart attack. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> he just didn't know what to do. And he, Billy Gibbons is a real gentleman. And he, he gave compliments to everyone in the band and met everyone, got everyone's names and like hung out. And, and it was just a great, great experience. I said, Billy, man, you know, great to see you as always. And like, thank you. And thanks for the guest passes. We, they were great. I said, thanks for, you know, coming and hanging out. We did photos together. Uh, I have them on the, on the hard drive. And he said, oh, yeah, I, you know, if I have some days off, I'll try and come see you guys. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Anyway, a few nights later, we've, we're somewhere else, Adelaide. I think we're in Adelaide, which is like Bakersfield, Australia. It's, it's small, really loyal audience we have there, but it's kind of off the beaten track. And after the show... Some young person who doesn't, you know, know the same music that I know. A young guy who works at the venue. Uh, a guy uh, wanted to say hello to you, an American. He said he couldn't stay because uh, he had to uh, go. But his, his name was uh, Bill, Billy. I said, Billy Gibbons had a beard. He went, yeah, yeah, had a beard and sunglasses. I said, Billy Gibbons? And we found out that Billy had a night off. Flew to Adelaide. No. Saw the band. I didn't know he flew there. Yeah. Flew there, saw the band, and like 
just said, tell him I said hello, I got to go. Probably just wow. got out of there before the encore, just so he didn't have to deal with people. Like, in, out. And, um, you know, you saw the other night, several weeks ago, when you and I were at the Classic Music Awards, I was, I was over there talking to him. Yeah, the Classic Rock Awards. That's a story. We'll do that sometime. Okay. Write that down, because that's something else. <laughs> yeah, Heidi and I were at this crazy thing, and, and Reverend Billy Gibbons was there. And yeah. uh, Anyway, we had these, these great experiences like that. And at one point in 2000 or so, we did a benefit at the Palladium, which is you know not great for sound. Uh, is either the Palladium or it was uh, the Avalon. I forget. I'm honestly forgetting which one it was. But it was a benefit for like Magic Johnson, you know, an HIV, an HIV thing, or it was a benefit. And we said, of course, we'll be on it. And we're backstage, and who's back there but Paul Stanley? of KISS. Mm -hmm. Now, our drummer Jason is like, you know, he's one of those, he's a KISS guy. In fact, Jason, Marcus, and Jim are all KISS fans. But for Jason, that's, that's his band. Like, has the records, will have long, pithy, and serious conversations about the, the Elder, the, the KISS album that no one likes. Henry, the Elder is a misunderstood record. <laughs> One day when we have time, let's listen to it together. I'm like, yeah, Jason, like, we really should do that. I bought that record because of him. It's not good. But I, <laughs> I, I bought it because Jason's like, Henry, people hate that album, but they shouldn't, man. And you're like, okay. <laughs> anyway, Paul Stanley, you find out, is a really cool guy, loves rock and roll, and he's backstage. My guys come up and they can barely speak. Henry... Paul, Paul Stanley is right over there. And I just walk over. I go, hey, Paul Stanley. Hey, man. You know, and, he, and he goes, hey, Henry Rollins. All right. And I said, I'd like to introduce you to my bandmates. I said, Paul Stanley, this is Jason McEnroth. And he's like, you know, hey, Jason, good to meet you. He's like, hey, hey, Paul. Cool, man. And, and he met all the band members. And he was a, com a complete gentleman. Wayne Kramer shows up. Cameras, camera people show up. We all do photos, and we do a photo of me and Paul and Wayne, and then just me and Paul, Stanley. And then Paul goes out to watch the band play from, like, the soundboard. And afterwards, we found out that he said to Mike, he's watching us play, and he leaned over to Mike and said, he's watching Jim. And he said, man... I gotta practice more. Oh, that's amazing. Cause I bet Paul Stanley would never call himself a great guitar player. He's like, you know, he, he's a songwriter, singer who plays some guitar. Like Dylan, he's not a guy who can like play a guitar and like blow your mind. But he said that. He said, I gotta practice more. He's, I'm this guy's killing me. Wow. So Jim's getting these compliments for some, you know, pretty big multi platinum mofos. And he deserves it. And so. We had these moments that were that were like that. Uh, we played in New York at Irving Plaza, and um, Marcus comes running up to me. I'm like talking to people, and uh, there's two different dressing room areas at Irving Plaza. Nowadays, you use the upstairs one, but back in my day, you use in Black Flag days, you use the one right off stage left. It's still around. I use that one because I remember that one. And so you want to find me? I'm always in that one because that's the one I've been in since I was like, you know, 20 years old or whatever. And so Marcus comes running to find me. He goes, oh, you're not going to believe who's in the dressing room. So I go to the other, the real dressing room. Tony Visconti does all the Bowie records. And, I, and he said, you know, and they introduce me. They go, hey, uh, Henry, Tony Visconti. I'm like, are you kidding? Because the guy is like one of the best producers in the world, like in the history of rock. And he's like, he's a really nice guy. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, guys are great tonight. I said, you came to see us? Oh, yeah, yeah, big fan. You guys are great. I'm like, uh-huh. I, I don't know what to do with this. And, and I love all this stuff. I'm not saying I'm not a big fan. I'm just saying for these guys to get 
kind of compliments and recognition from people like that. Like when Billy Gibbons comes backstage, he goes, hey, great show. I mean, that was a huge moment for me, too. But for these guys, it was like, wow, we're, we're not messing around. We are, we're in the mix. And I was really happy that they ha we had those moments and they had a chance to, you know, get all that and have all those, those times. And so we toured our proverbial tails off, kind of right record tour as you do. And we did that with a vengeance. And later on, these all the outtakes of a, one album would become another album. And so if, when you tally everything up, we released five studio albums and three live albums in five years. Wow. I mean, it was, yeah, that's... we rang the bells. You know, yeah. we, we went out there and really ran it at it as hard as we could. And then we all got together and did the West Memphis Three Benefit record. And that was the last time we toured was, was when we did 2003, the Rise Above tour. And so we went, Rollins Band with Mother Superior, went like 98 to 2003, kind of without ever really taking that much of a break. I would, we would take a break so they could do Mother Superior stuff, and I would go out and do talking tours. So I go run out and do my thing, and then come back, and we go basically right into band practice. So Those were those years you were never here. Well, yeah, because I was doing like 75, 80 shows of them. Yeah. And then Mike and I would leave like three weeks later to go do the whole lap again just alone. I remember seeing you for like a couple months a year, really. Yeah, yeah. That's for five years. Yeah. And so the last, you know, big hoorah for us was summer uh, 2003. So you woke up one morning. Yeah, and at the end of all that, and that, that Rise Above thing was a very emotional, you know, we're fighting for the lives of these three guys, and we're doing this Black Flag music, which for me was very emotionally, uh, a lot of epiphanies and reverie, you know, doing that music, because it takes you back. So anyway, we get to the end of that tour, and we come home, and everyone just kind of gets a few days just to kind of go, ugh. And I woke up one morning, and I realized, like someone, it's like someone was telling me. It's not, not even me. It's like someone said, oh, here's an announcement. Memo. You're done. You're done with lyrics. And I, I went, really? And so a voice said, yeah, you're done. And I said, well, let's see. Come up with a song idea. And it, it was like I'm a guy who never wrote a single song or never wanted to. There was not one single idea. Say it was like a tube of toothpaste. You know, like, oh, there's nothing left in that tube. You can still get, like, five more toothbrushes full of toothpaste. You keep squeezing it in different ways. I was done. There was nothing left. There's not one thing I wanted to write about that either I had not written about or had not written about, like, five or more times. Like, she left me again, or I'm mad about this again. I could have written those songs, but it would have been like, okay, I'm a guy who's going to try and write a song, not a guy who's writing a song. You would have he, hated yourself. You yeah. You would have hated I, yourself. I didn't need to. Right. There's no more need to write a song. So anything that's going to come out of me will be at least several percent saccharine, fake. Mm -hmm. And even if it's one percent fake, it destroys the, the credibility of the 99. So either you go in 100 percent raging or don't show up. And that's just my, you know, whatever, anybody can do whatever they want. That's just me. I just don't, I don't want to ever want to fake it. And so I called the guys. I said, fellas, I'm done. You're young. You're, you're barely taking off. You're, you're just walking into what you're going to be. But I think I'm, I'm taking the coat off and I'm putting it up on the hook. I'm hanging up the spikes and I'm, I'm out. We've done our thing. It was a great thing. I think we have realized our potential together, or I've realized my potential in music. And it was great to have finished it on such a high note with you guys who never didn't want to play. Like they never went, oh, uh, they went out there like, man, let's, before every gig, Jim would look at us like the quarterback, be like, let's do it. Aww. And we'd all go, let's do it. Like he said. And we just go out there and just like crush it. Even on jet lag, even like, oh, I'm so tired. It's like, let's do it. 
Like, all right. Because he said. And you just go out there and, like, you wake up. And you all of a sudden you're like, damn, man, I'm so happy to be in a band. And so for me it ended. For the guys in Mother Superior, they were on to the next record, the next record, the next record. And then they eventually kind of flew apart and all have gone on to, like, Jason, Jason. Blue Man Group, mm -hmm. Marcus, Solo Records, and Jim, jeez, Solo Records. Daniel Lenoir. Playing with Daniel Lenoir, playing with Emmylou Lou Harris. Harris. Has a new band, uh, Motor Sister, with Scott Ian of Anthrax. I haven't heard it, but you said it, it blew is, your head off. It is unbelievable, because Scott Ian's not messing around. That guy is so not messing around. And him and Jim together, I that'll tear your roof off. And there's a 30-second... If you just, I think if you go into your browser and just type in Jim Wilson mother motor sister you'll see like they have like a 30 second ad who just shows them playing you're like i want that record i mean it's ripping so everyone kind of landed on their feet musically and i just kind of went into i said okay and it was a very hard thing to like wow i'm not doing music anymore who am i it was, it was a quarter it century took you a moment i know and it but it was tough but i knew I, it was, I knew it was the right thing to do and it was the brave thing to do because to make money, I remember it, when you told me I didn't believe you. I was like, "What?" Well, for a few days, I didn't believe me because I just couldn't imagine you right. not doing music. Yeah, but you were so adamant that you didn't want to be that guy. Yeah, who was phoning it in. Right, and I was like, "All right." Because you know, I, it's for me, it's hard enough for me just to be able to look at myself in the mirror every morning and go, "Okay, eh, I'll, I'll, you're, I'll give you a pass." But if I have to like phone in a gig, and to me the stage is like this most sacred ground I know. That's the place where you you give it up. And so, I, like sitting here right now, it'd be fun, like getting on a roller coaster or driving fast or going to a you know one of those crazy theme parks, to go and play twenty songs that I've been involved with for fun, like a pickup game of basketball, or like hey we're all in the garage doing. You know, whatever covers, man, you know, get it, you know, grab a mic, sing free songs. Like, okay, yeah, I can do that. Hope I don't throw my back out or whatever. And I could do it like in a garage for fun because you're just doing it. And you know, you're not asking anyone of anything, you're not charging them money, and you're not saying, hey, I'm doing a thing, pay attention. But I could never go out and do it meaningfully and have it be meaningful. It'd be a lie. And I just, and I'm not saying if someone else does it, it's a lie. But for me, and I really want to be careful because I don't want some guy, well, I go out and play my old music. What, I'm a liar? Like, well, no, 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 no. Just for me. I just don't want it. I'm not saying it's a blow yeah. to anyone's integrity. And we've gotten, well, you've gotten offers for the Rollins Band to do festivals not that long ago. No, no, we, we get them every year. Yeah, and you always say no. Yes, yeah, either people who say, who calls the agent, you know, get them, they go back. Yeah. And get back together. We'll give him X amount of money. Right. Or and it's a lot of money. Yeah. Or people who just say, "Oh, he doesn't have a band." Like they just didn't know. Like, "Oh, we just wanted him to play in." Oh, mm -hmm. hasn't had a band in 180 years. Right. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. But quite often it's like but those festival shows. Oh no, they've yeah. offered yeah uh, well, plenty of money. But mm -hmm. and who doesn't like money? I'll, I'll take some money. But and it's a term I use. That money has to smell right. Of course. If it doesn't smell right, you can't. I don't want it. And the audience always knows. Yeah. You can't do it. They know. If they, it's like, uh, like, up oh, nose job. I mean, like, look, like, mm -hmm. always tell. It's like cosmetic surgery. Like, you can tell. Like, even the smallest thing. Like, did you do a thing? You can tell when someone on, on the stage is phoning it in. You're like, oh, the tambourine player's not into it. I'm out of here. Because it, it ruins no Everything. matter what anyone else in the band is doing. And I don't want to be in a band with people like that. But I don't want to be that person in a band. And so... It took me a moment, and I told management, I said, guess what? And Richard, you know, he was like, hold on, I have to sit down. Because for him, it's a way of life. You know, Henry, the band, the thing, his, you know, part of his paycheck, but part of, you know, posters. He had posters of me, music posters all over his office. It was like what we were doing together for yeah. like 20 years. And it came to an end. He goes, okay, well, he recovered. He went, okay, so what? More movies, more TV, more spoken word, more voice. Everyone, yeah, look more of everything else, and we'll see what else happens. And so I gave it. I said, well, I'll give it a year of just like 
seeing what comes my way. And basically, it's like one of those things where you lose something, and if you don't worry about it, you don't, it just, things happen, like, mm -hmm. say you dig a trench. Somehow, after enough time, something fills it. And within a year, you're doing more talking shows, you're doing more film, more documentary, more voiceover, where you don't even notice that you don't do music anymore. Oh, and now you're writing for the LA Weekly, you're, you're writing this. You're writing more. You're traveling more. And now you're working, wow, you're like busier than you were when you had a band. Like, how are you gonna do all this stuff this year? And so I ended up being busier because all this other stuff, like, oh, you're not doing, doing a band nine months a year? Well, then we want you to do this. Or, ooh, ooh, over here. So I started saying yes to like all kinds of National Geographic, um, independent film channel, you know, just all this other stuff, more film, uh, more cartoon voiceovers, more fun documentary voiceovers. And like Henry goes to Africa, Southeast Asia, just more me out in the world with my camera, learning things and coming back with good stories for the talking tours. And so it all kind of ended on a good note. I didn't have to be some guy Hey, remember me? I wrote this song in 1821. You would have never let that happen. Yeah, but I would have been a really awful, it yeah. would have been really awful had I gone down that road. I know I wouldn't have. No. But it was a really tough thing to walk away from, but there really was no choice. No, but I'm glad you got to end it with, with those guys because I think that was the happiest I ever saw you in w doing music. Yeah. Absolutely. And had I, you know, when me and Melvin and Simon Teo and Chris all said, okay, we're done. You know, we've graduated, time to leave the temple. And I'd stopped doing music then. I think there would have always been that thing of like, damn, man, I got this idea for a song. Like there's an itch you can't scratch. There would have been a big what if. Yeah. And there are a couple of standing offers mm -hmm. that I have that... I've expressed interest to people and they've expressed interest to me. Musically. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I, something in me wants to do that. Um, actually, two offers, and I want to do them both. Mm -hmm. And since they're chickens that haven't hatched, you know, it's not for me to say because these people can change their minds. But two offers came my way. I'm like, damn, this, as soon as I come up with a lyric idea, or if I ever do, I'm going to call you. And I have kept in touch with all of those parties and said, and they said, hey, the door's open. You call us. We're ready. And they're really cool, like crazy cool. And they're heroes of yours. And they're heroes of mine. And so you never know. So out of all the music you've done, hmm. you enjoyed it with those guys the most as far as enjoyment that's what i'm talking about. oh yeah as far as a smile on my face yeah as far as the best music i ever made i have no idea i it, every song i've ever been involved is is like a kid of yours but as far as like fun and lack of tension day to day m me and the mother superior guys we're like f three happy guys who want to be where they are at that moment so let's see, what do I have here? Oh no! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that sound can only mean one thing. Ow! <laughs> oh, oh, it hurt. W when sound effects attack. Let's see. Um, it is now time for... Heidi's Headlines. Okay, today's Heidi's Headline is Henry gets aggro and wants to leave the coffee shop because <laughs> dot 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 the Rawlings Band comes on the radio. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Hold, hold on a minute. Before we say anything, I want to talk about you for a minute. Me? You, well, you have all these rules and regulations for yourself. Must be up at 445. Must be in the gym by 5. Must walk 872 miles before 10 a.m. I have a Fitbit I must account to. If I don't get the miles in, I'll walk the dog. If the dog wears out, I'll take the dog home and I'll walk the rest of the miles myself. Or if I can't get Miles to walk, I'll march in my hotel room at South by Southwest, you maniac. 
Anyway, Heidi doesn't drink coffee. It's just, it's just one of Heidi's rules. She drinks it only very sporadically when she borrows the cup of Rawlings, as she just checked her Fitbit. And so every once in a while, when Heidi wants coffee, she'll, she'll suggest that I need some coffee. Henry, you should get some coffee. And I, you know, I do enjoy a cup of coffee. So Heidi and I emerge from the wild overrun chaos and fun that is South by Southwest. We uh, are going to fly back to L.A. from Austin. So we go into the airport and Heidi says, you should get a cup of coffee. Like, this is this great idea. And I went, oh, somebody wants a cup of coffee. She goes, shut up. Let's go. So we find a coffee place. We sit down and the cup of coffee is actually really good. And so I go, here, drink some, drink some, drink some. And she's baby bear. It's too hot. I'm like, whatever. And so we're, she's, we're, we're enjoying this very good cup of free trade coffee, a fair trade coffee. And all of a sudden, behind the counter of the coffee place, I hear a Rawlings Band song. Which one? Low Self Opinion. And I got up tight. And I, I said, uh, no, you, d d d tell, tell them what I said. We were having a nice time. Suddenly, Henry's face looks like Charlie Manson. He gets his, his eyes turn black when he gets mad. Truly. Uh huh. You, you physically change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what? We have to go. <laughs> I said, why? I just want to sit here and drink coffee. We have to go. They're playing the Rollins band. So? What's the big whoop? You were in a band. You recorded. Be happy it's being played. And it's not filed in the where are they now. Which it probably is. Just be happy. <laughs> no. You get angry and we have to leave. I got uptight and self-conscious. Henry, no. It was a coincidence, by the way. You never know. It. What? Uh, music I've made is so popular. Oh, yeah, it's like ABBA. You just walk in and there it is. That station they were playing was like a rock station. It was, was it? It could have been like buried vinyl or something. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, all I know, and all I know is Ow. we had to leave. <laughs> Jeez. I had to get up and leave. You're funny. Buried vital. <laughs> <laughs> we had to get up and leave because Henry got upset because someone was playing his song. Really? Was I really upset or just... Uh, Henry, just you were mad. <laughs> What's that yeah, mad? you turn into like Sergeant Bilko. Let's go. <laughs> you get really military-ish. <laughs> Sergeant General. Uh-huh. Rawlings. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what happened. That's what happened. So, everybody, thank you. Thank you. So much for listening. See how I did that? That's, a, that's called production. I just flew in the applause. I didn't, even, I didn't even telegraph it. I just did it. And now I'm going to turn the mic actually towards the NS10 speaker. Because we don't have a mixing board. <laughs> we just turned the mic around. Okay, Lamont, come in and do your lines of uh, for this new shadow broadcast. It's me. Who said that? It's me, the shadow. <laughs> the tree of evil bears bitter fruit. The shadow knows. Wait, you never heard the shadow? No. Until next week, this is Henry Rawlings. And Heidi May. Thanks Thank for you. listening. And so now the mics have been shut off, but we, oh, the sound effect went away. <laughs> and, and we think we're off the air now, but we're not. It's, it's, it's not return to forever. It's not weather report. It's not King Crimson. It's not like 80,000 chords. It's rock and roll. No, it's, but it's the rock and roll band you were wanting. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not here to put down my bandmates at all because they're all great. But the Rollins band with Melvin Sim... Uh, and, and Chris had turned into this thing where it got very jazzy, which is cool, just not for a singer like me. I need backbeat. I need a beat that makes me stand up and want to get busy. And, and you know what I'm talking about. You just yeah. need something that's behind you. And these guys are bing, bang, 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 bang. My fellas, it sounds like a bullet ricocheting around a birdcage. I buy records like that. 
but I can't sing on it because there's nothing for me to sink your teeth in. Yeah. Yeah. And Sim and Melvin, I mean, these guys are coming. I'm like two and two is four guy. Those guys are coming from Harvard math. Mm -hmm. And so is Chris. I mean, they're talking in like four abstract zero multi-level chess. And I'm like a guy who loses at checkers. And so I need Ramones, <laughs> Stooges, whatever. And they're coming at me with this whole other thing. And it, it's one of the reasons that Coming and Burn took so long to make. I said, you guys, help me. And so I, I really wanted a band. I, I didn't want to make dumb music or simple music. I just wanted to make really hard-hitting rock music that you could play really loud and really enjoy and on stage play so hard your body would fall apart. I wanted to do shows where everyone in the band would walk off stage completely destroyed because the music you can play it so hard. That's what an audience wants, I think. Well, that's what I want as an audience member. I want to see a band up there murdering it. And I want to. I want them to break me to pieces with their music. That's why I paid my eight, my ten bucks to go in. I want you to rip me up. Anyway, that's what the Mother Superior guys delivered in just by the truckload, like effortlessly. And we had such a good time. And I'm used to play music for ten minutes, talk about theory for half an hour. Where the MS guys, they just plug in and look at you, and go like, "We're ready." And I go, hey, let, for fun, let's do a, a Thin Lizzy cover. You guys know Are You Ready? And they're like, oh, yeah. And, like, all of a sudden we're playing Are You Ready by Thin Lizzy. Like, that took seven minutes. And one goes, hey, let's play The Boys Are Back in Town. Like, let's do it. <laughs> like, And I go, you guys know that? And they're like, yeah, sure. And I kind of know it. But it was fun being in a room with three sweaty people who just want to bash it out. Because I was not used to that. I hadn't done, been in a band like that for a long time. And so that kind of infectious four guys in a room with their tails all wagging led to a lot of music making. And in a few band practices, we had kind of sketched, roughly sketched out like 12 or 14 songs. And so we, we banged uh, on them for another few days. And these guys are like ready. I said, okay, do you guys want to go record them? And they're like, yeah. Were you still on DreamWorks? Oh, yeah. I owed them a record. And I said, well, I guess this is my record. And so quickly, we go into, I think, uh, Cherokee. And we bash out the songs very quickly. And we go in with a ton of music. We do two sessions of like 12 or 14 songs each. We just had tons of tunes. Went to Sunset Recorders to do the vocals. And we're using Cliff Norell who engineered Come In and Burn. He's just like this guy I know. He lives in L.A. He's honest and competent as the day is long. He's just a seriously good dude, great engineer, and solid. Like, you can trust him when he goes, ah, too much bass. You're like, okay, pull the bass down because Cliff says there's too much. He's a good reference monitor. And so I trust Cliff, and Cliff loved the band, loved the music. He said, wow, this is really exciting. Let's, let's mix this and make it really, really cool. And so we mixed... The Get Some Go Again record, which I was really excited about. I'd put it on and get a real buzz. I'd listen to the song Get Some Go Again. I'm like, man, that's exactly like I heard it in my head. Like, this is a rush to play. I can play it loud. Makes you want to run around. Anyway, I play it, the, the thing for management. And their manager, Richard, goes, wow, this is different. I go, yeah, man, we're rocking out. He goes, yeah, I get it. So... He says, well, what are you going to call it? And I said, well, Henry Rollins and Mother Superior, because that's what it is. He said, no, 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 you can't do that. I said, why not? He said, no one will know what it is. DreamWorks will hate it. No one will understand the title. It has to be the Rollins Band. And I said, but it's not. The Rollins Band is, you know, the other thing. And he said, no, you, you've made that name. You've earned that name. It's a name that people know. He says, we can't put you on the festivals with Henry Rollins and Mother Superior. You'll just, no festival guy will buy it. That's just the sad truth. And was he right or wrong? Who, who knows? I mean, he's just talking. And, and Richard only meant for the best, but this was his expert advice. And I took it. And I was to find out that 
I maybe should have given that some more consideration or, well, and I, I'm only blaming myself. I should have handled it a little differently. And I'll, you want me to talk about that? Well, by calling well, the old members. Yeah, I did not know. I didn't, well, I didn't think that much about what calling this new group of people, the Rollins Band, if what it would mean to the old members. And I didn't think about it because I, I was kind of done thinking about them. Like that 97 tour was in a way very traumatic. You know, you're close to a band, you're brothers, you know, you, and in a band, people die. There's divorces, marriages. I mean, there's real life stuff. We had been through all of that. And by the time the band was over, I was really done with those guys. Like the way you want to like, clobber your brother or something. You're so close to them. You just, just never want to see them again. I love these guys, but I was like happy to never see them again. They may, they probably felt the same way. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's what happens in a band. It's, it's why. Yeah, it's like divorcing four people. Yeah, it's like when bands can't talk to each other, but they can play on stage. Otherwise, they'll just beat each other up. That's kind of how it gets. Because you're just too much time, too close. You know each other too well. Anyway, uh, I had a bit of that with those guys. Liking them as much as I did, anyway, I didn't really consider them or their feelings. I went, uh-huh, Rollins Band, okay. Never thinking that it might bum those guys out. And I, I can't defend myself at all. I, I was just unthinking. As, you know, it's on me. And so... Time goes on, the record gets announced, it's in the trades, Rollins Band gets them go again. I get a letter from Chris Haskett, guitar player in the other, the older lineup, the original lineup. A guy I've known since I was like kind of sort of right out of high school. And he's one of the goodest people I've ever met. Chris, there's, if you have a problem with Chris Haskett, you really need to check yourself. It's true. Because he really is. No, he's a sweetheart. He's a real sweetheart. And he wrote me, and he's like, you know, I, I really in, he, in his own wonderful way, he said, I really didn't appreciate reading about the Rollins band that I'm not in, in Billboard. Like, couldn't you have written all of us and just either asked us or said, hey, I'm doing this? Like, why do we have to read it on MTV.com? And I was like, damn, I screwed that up. And he's like, he's, and Chris said, you know, I'm not mad. I'm just kind of hurt and kind of disappointed and I don't mind making people mad that just happens but I, I'm not into hurting people I'm really I, I'm not I'm not interested in that do you remember how you responded to him yeah I said I'm sorry man I, I, I that's on me and I said you know Richard suggested that it's a name that has been you know suggested uh, you know that that's been established but I should have done that and I'm sorry. And I didn't hear from Melvin or Sim or Teo immediately, but I discussed it with all three of them in the years afterwards. Sim and I were in the back of the bus on that weird Rollins Band X tour in 2006. And he looked at me, he was smiling. He said, you know, for a while, I really hated you. <laughs> I love the honesty. And I looked at him and I said, same here, my friend. And we both just laughed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I talked to Melvin about it. He said, yeah, man, I know you were doing what you had to do. He kind of had an, a, an adult pro thing on it. And Teo, he says, Teo. He goes, oh, man, you know, who gives a shit? <laughs> he, just, <laughs> does, he, just, he just rolls. Anyway. We go into the studio and we record in like two different sessions an incredible amount of music where we are literally spoiled for choice. You know, like 30 some songs. <laughs> this is this is us trying to do a podcast some days. <laughs> The thing that says attempt to start weak battery, well, the, the last several seconds of that actually resembles uh, the relationship of Heidi May and Henry Rawlings 
It's interesting, <laughs> combative, explosive, and ultimately, someone's probably going to get hurt. <laughs> Hello, Earthlings. My name is Henry Rawlings, and the other one on the other end of the line is... Heidi May. And so, Heidi, before we get into anything... Yeah. Uh, don't don't get testy yet. I'm not testy. Okay, well, you know, you, it, it comes out quickly. You, 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 you're rising. You know, you, you're like, you're like a, um, a classical record. You have full dynamic range. You go from down here to way up here, like on a dime. Anyway, several minutes before we uh, hooked up all the gear to bring you this podcast, and by the way, thank you so much for listening to it, I showed Heidi May a letter that was sent in by a wonderful gal named Heather who baked a pie, and she said, I baked a pie. I said, okay, so I opened the letter, and it's, it's, it's an image of a, I guess what looks like a blueberry pie, and the top of the pie, there's no crust on it really except for four strips four rectangular strips arranged in the black flag logo and she said i made you a black flag pie and i wrote her back and i said fantastic and all the members can sue each other over it <laughs> <laughs> i want a bigger uh, slice <laughs> exactly <laughs> but you didn't write the pie you get a smaller <laughs> slice but i do get a slice right that is to be negotiated well, what if you put the picture of the pie on a T-shirt? <laughs> You'll get sued. And so, we know from experience. Yes, and so anyway, it was funny. And um, and it looks delicious. Heidi May is someone, and, and I want to get this straight. She has a diet, but she doesn't diet in that she's not dieting she just there's food she eats and there's food she doesn't eat she basically watches what she eats as we as we all should do heidi doesn't do sugar she doesn't do dairy she eats like kind of scrub brush clean good food and it's cool i mean it makes her very makes her too healthy for me and that i can't handle it she comes bouncing in here all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed just furious at me anyway no i'm not but anyway so heidi i think ha she misses the days of sugar of her past i do when she used to look at you know whatever it was <laughs> sweet tarts or airheads. whatever and just go i love you airheads yeah i love you and she used to love diet pepsi like she would literally mm -hmm. say hello to the can mm -hmm. i love you diet pepsi yeah. and she'd open one <laughs> and drain it and then open another one, and I would take, I take these bags out, bags of cans out to the the blue recycle can. I go, how do you do that? I'm like, shut up! I'm thirsty. I'm like, wow. I haven't had any Diet Pepsi in five years. Jeez. Sad. And you know why, ladies and gentlemen? Aspartame. I had to get, I had to get Aspartame. healthy. I got bit by a Lyme tick. <laughs> and, and that's Don't right. Let, that was horrible. 40 days on antibiotics. Anyway. Okay. I do want a piece of that pie. Look at it. Yeah, we're looking at it right now. And boy, if we had cameras up, we could all look at it together. You know what I should do? I'll, I'll write Heather a leather letter, and I'll ask her if we can if we can post that. So if I can get the green light to post that, would you post that? Yeah, we could post it. All right, I'll, I'll write good old Are Heather today. Are we going to get today. sued? Well, I'll write Heather and ask. <laughs> no, but by everyone else. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> might be improper use of the logo. It might be. And so let me let me let me let me break it down to you. Can we tell them about the book? Can we? Can I do a brief like a, a ten second infomercial about the book or no? Yeah, you can. But this is going to be like you know three weeks after the fact. Okay, it, this is coming out way after the fact. I just want to remind you. How about this? I'm going to remind you that after a great deal of effort, uh, two thirteen has evinced yet another book of mine called Before the Chop Two. And you can find it at a nominal price at henryrollins.com. But this is in the, this happened a long time ago, so you're just being reminded. Anyway, uh, Heidi, I'm just going to ask you, just, just don't get angry. Is there anything that you would like me to talk about today? Any story you'd like me to tell? Anything you'd like me to recount? Any Anything you'd like me to juggle or any way I can entertain you? and make you happy. 
Yes, I think we should do part two of the Rollins Band because we've gotten so many requests. That's true. Yeah. Okay. The Mother Superior years. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Um, a super brief recap of the first episode of the Rawlings Band. The Rawlings Band came to a kind of a, a sad but eventual end at the end of 97 in Japan. Basically, the parts had worn out. The band played really well and really hard. Everyone was great, but it was over. It was just done. And everyone knew it. And it was just time for everyone to go their separate ways and prosper. And that was the end of 97. And so by early 19, uh, yes, by early 98, I was in touch with what would be the start, what would be, I was in touch with Jim Wilson, the guitar player in Mother, a local LA band called Mother Superior. Jim, I knew because he worked at Aaron's Records, which was, you know, was basically eradicated uh, because of Amoeba. Mm -hmm. Amoeba came to town, like right down the street from it and kind of ate Aaron's. But before Amoeba, Aaron's was the killer go-to place for indie music and all kinds of music. I was in there all the time. And I'd always see this really friendly guy behind the counter named Jim. And one time Jim said, hey, man, he said he's like the nicest guy. Jim said, hey, would you listen to my, my band's new record? I'm like, yeah, man. And he gives me this CD, and it's Mother Superior. And he goes, that's our band. I said, okay, man. And I, I bought some records, and I went back to the office. And I said, well, I'll put Jim's record on first. And I put it on, and it knocked me out. It just I loved it, especially there was a song uh, called The Wiggle, and it's just a really cool song. I'm just trying to be slick and see if I can pull it up, but I don't think I can. Anyway, it's just a great up-tempo, really sizzling boogie number, and, the, and you can tell immediately Jim can sing his ass off. The guy plays guitar. He's just scorching. I called him at the store. I said, Jim, I'm listening to your record. You guys are killing me, man. When are you playing the next show? I want to go. If there's anything I can do for you, you know, like, if there's anything I can do to help, let me know, man. I mean, I don't know what I can do, but I'd like to help. And he's like, oh, man, thanks. And so one thing leads to another. And he said, hey, would you come and help us make our next record? Like kind of be another set of ears and maybe help produce and mix. I'm like, yeah. And he, he said, you know, we can't pay you anything. Oh, I, said, I know. No one ever calls me for help with a record and has any money. So it's no problem. I said, so what's, what's the deal? He goes, well, we're practicing. If you want to come by and hear the new songs. I'm like, I do. I really want to hear you guys before the studio. So I, I drove down to a practice place, which is, I think it's like Selma, or one of those small east-west streets below Hollywood, above Sunset, but it basically kind of sort of dead ends into Hollywood High. And it's a row of practice spaces that the first time I practiced with Black Flag, I was in one of those rooms. And I see the address. I'm like, oh, that place. I haven't been in there for like 100 years. And I pull in and nostalgia's hitting me. And I remember like the third or fourth night of Black Flag practice. I, it was like either in the room next to where Mother Superior was or in the room itself. Robo quit. Black Flag's drummer quit. I quit. I quit Black Flag. I quit. And he storms out. And no one in the band moves. And I'm like, wait a minute. I just got out here. The band is breaking up. No, 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 no. No, the, the toy can't be broken. I haven't even driven the thing for 20 miles yet. So I went chasing after Robo. Like, it's up to me to bring the drummer back to Black Flag so I can have a band to be in. Why did he want to quit? I, he got mad at Greg. And, you know, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. <laughs> Robo quit. He would always talk about himself in the third, third person. person. Robo quit. Robo's had enough. So I said, I said, Robo, and he was just at the blow off steam. And so he walks out. I think he makes a left on Highland going towards uh, Sunset. So I kind of go, Robo, 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 and I calm him down, and I talk him off the ledge. I go, let's go back into band practice, and you guys will get along. And he was gone by December. That would be around, this was like late July, early August. Anyway, so I go back in down memory lane. I go into this small room, and there's Mother Superior. And I said, hey, and I, I you know, I, I kind of met these guys before, and they're all really swell. So I said, play me some songs. They play these new songs, and they're just really rocking. And, they're, you know, they have fun playing. And I had, 
you know, I had was done with Melvin, Sim, Chris, and Teo, and that we had kind of broken up. But I wasn't done doing music. I had ideas, riff ideas, lyric ideas, like a bunch of them. So we got to talking, and I said, fellas, would you ever want to, like, if I wanted to go in the studio and bang out some songs, would you guys maybe want to be the band that plays the songs? And they just, no one hesitated. Like, yeah, did let's you, go. Did you go in there with that in the back of your mind? I, I'm not, Honestly, I'm not remembering. But you heard them play and it came to you? Yeah, because they're just so into it. And they're such nice guys. I'd never seen them together in the practice area, in, in in the practice thing where they're collaborating, hey, let's try this. Because when we're work, we're we're, we're basically pre-production. We're in a cheap practice place, getting the songs together. They play a song. I go, okay. Just listening, it's a verse chorus too long. I mean, the thing, like you're killing me. It's like six and a half minutes. You got to pull it in, at least for the record. And we're making notes, and that's when I started saying, and. No one gave me any resistance. I go, oh, that's a great idea. And then they'd play it that way in one take. I go, okay, shorten that by half and do something coming out of the lead. Like, do half the bridge to come back into the verse so you're not jamming the guitar lead into the next verse. And like, and then one take like, like this, you're like, yeah, wow, you guys are like session guys. They can just dial it in and do it. They're that good. Did you say to them the first day? Would you want to hang out? Oh, yeah, but only after I watched how quickly right. you go, try this. And remember when you and I were in the studio doing the Rollins show, the Rollins show, and R R Ryan Adams was, was, were you there for that? When mm -hmm. Ryan Adams, you, mm -hmm. you were there. Remember he said, okay, fellas, on this version of the song, we'll, come, we'll do 16 of the thing at the beginning, only use your hi-hat. And do this and do that and change your guitar thing from this to this. And they go, okay. And they would just do it perfectly. And then, remember, he did like five versions mm -hmm. of like three different songs and they're all completely different. All single takes. Because he said, oh, try this, this, and this. That's how the MS guys are. Right. They're just that good. And I just saw a band that can just do it. And I said, okay. I said, fellas, I've got, I got no band, but I got a ton of ideas. Are you at all interested in being paid in full to go into the studio and kind of sort of be a band? And they they just kind of lunged at me like, yeah, like right now. I said, well, you want to take a minute and goof around because I, I got a I got a riff, and they're like, go. And it was the song "Get Some Go Again," which is there's nothing to it. I mean, it's like two notes, but it's just I'd have it in my head humming it. And I had most of the lyrics. It's not a big lyric, and it's not a very tough song to put together. And I said, here it is. And I hummed it to him, and they kind of nodded, and they went, okay. And all of a sudden, I have taken Jim's mic that he's singing into, and, and we're having band practice with this song, which we played like five times, just working on it. And I said, wow, that was, okay, let me, let's go back to Mother Superior practice. I'm sorry. But let's let's revisit the idea. And we got to talking about it. And I said, okay, how about I'll book some practice time, or I'm, I'm paying, and let's do some songwriting. And we got together, and we just, I said, um, okay, I got a lyric, boom, 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 and I'm looking for something with a lot of toms, like the toms are going to drive it, like, you know, doom, boom, 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 boom. And they're, all of a sudden, Jason's taken off on this big drum thing, and Marcus, the bass player, is just filling it out. And Jim's looking at me. I said, I don't know, like a, you know, like some MC5 big guitar. And Jim, like, like this. I'm like, hey, we're a band. And songwriting, it was immediate. Like, we'd, we'd play, play for like three hours. And, wow, we have four songs. Well, you know, four songs that are kind of sort of songs. The only thing that would be lacking would be the lyrics. Because these guys can just write songs. And 